welcome to the 36th lecture of cryogenic engineering under the NPTEL program. We have covered various topics till now and they are as follows and the last we finished was cryogenic insulations under cryogenic engineering. So, now the current topic which we are going to talk about is vacuum technology. A brief has already been mentioned about vacuum technology in the earlier lecture regarding cryogenic insulation. However, vacuum is a very important technology and it will be used everywhere in cryogenic engineering and therefore, it is very important to understand what is this vacuum about and if I want to get good vacuum, what is a good vacuum practice, what are different vacuum pumps that could be used and things like that. What is most important to understand is what are vacuum fundamentals. So, under this topic, we will understand what is the need of vacuum in cryogenics, although it is little bit clear in the earlier topic when we covered cryogenic insulation. We will know what are vacuum fundamentals, very basic knowledge to understand and how can good vacuum be obtained, what are different technologies, what are different nomenclatures that are used to get good vacuum. Then what is conductance and electrical analogy applied to vacuum technology. Pumping speed, we use various pumps, how do we get different pumping speeds and what are pump down times for respective pumps and then we will talk about in a brief about some vacuum pumps that are normally used. This topic will be covered in around 3 lectures and we will have some tutorial assignments at the end of uh, in various topics at various points in time. So, in today's lecture we will understand what is the need of vacuum in cryogenics, some basics of vacuum that under vacuum fundamentals and conductance and electrical analogy to understand what is this conductance business that is prevalently used in vacuum technology used in cryogenics. We know that the net heat in leak into a cryogenic vessel is due to various modes of mechanism of heat transfer. So, I can write Q net, the net heat in leak in a cryogenic vessel will be because of Q gas conduction, Q gas convection. Q solid conduction and Q radiation. This is also we have seen in cryogenic insulation. And if I produce good vacuum, the gas component can be completely ruled out. It will not be present over there. It will not be equal to 0, but we can say that the amount of gas available in a particular space would be negligible or we can neglect Q gas conduction and therefore, we can also neglect Q convection which is going to be caused presence of gas in that particular space. So, if I would a good vacuum, the first two Q, I can say that Q gas conduction and Q convection can be completely taken care of or they will get minimized. All right. So, gas conduction and convection are minimized. The losses occurring because of this or heat in leak occurring because of gas convection and conductions are minimized by having vacuum between two surfaces of different temperatures. So, if I have good vacuum, the first two losses or heat in leaks can be completely taken care of if I got good vacuum. Second thing we also know, know that use of evacuated or opacified powder which basically uses vacuum over there, it will decrease K A apparent thermal conductivity. And we also know that multilayer insulation which takes care of solid conduction as well as Q radiation. Solid conduction is taken care by different aspects having you know very small size perlite powder or having spacers, we know that optimum number of MLIs could be used so that Q solid conduction also could be minimized. So, MLI can definitely reduce Q radiations, also it will minimize Q solid conduction and we know that all these powders and also multilayer insulation work only when good vacuum is there. So, that means that all these modes of heat transfer which bring about heat in leak into the system can be taken care of if we are having very good vacuum. So, vacuum technology forms a very important aspect in cryogenics. We have just seen that all these modes of heat transfer gets minimized when we have a very good vacuum and therefore, vacuum becomes an integral part of cryogenic engineering or a very important technology to be used always with cryogenics. So, what do we mean by vacuum? The word vacuum comes from Latin roots. It means empty or the void. So, actually nothing. A perfect vacuum can be defined as a space with no particles of any state. So, no presence of solid liquid gas particles in a space. If that is so, then we will say it is perfect vacuum. It is important to note 
that the upper definition is a theoretical understanding. We cannot have a perfect vacuum and therefore, practically it is impossible to achieve perfect vacuum. You can have a very low pressure, very, very low pressure, but you cannot get perfect vacuum. That means, nothing is present over there, no particles are present over there. This is something which is very idealistic situation and therefore, practically it is impossible to achieve perfect vacuum. The pressures in vacuum are lower than atmospheric pressures, that is why we call it vacuum. The degree of vacuum is decided by the mean free path. We have touched upon lambda mean free path in the earlier lecture also and depending on the value of this mean free path, we have got different degrees of vacuum and before that let us understand what is this mean free path, although it has already been touched upon in cryogenic insulation. So, what is mean free path? Mean free path is defined as the average distance travelled by the molecules between the subsequent collisions. That means, from one collision to second collision, whatever path it travels, whatever distance it travels, it is called as mean free path. And as you know that, as you go on reducing the pressure, the number of molecules will be getting reduced and reduced and therefore, the path will increase. The path between two collisions will start increasing and as the pressure gets lower down to a very low level, their molecular collisions may stop and the molecule may hit the walls directly. In that case, that is the maximum mean free path possible in that case. So, lambda is given by, a mean free path is given by this particular expression, lambda is equal to mu by p into pi r t by 0.2 to the power 0.5, where mu is the viscosity of the gas, p is the pressure of the gas and t is the temperature of the gas. So, there are different parameters and one can calculate the value of lambda or mean free path accordingly and r is a specific gas constant. So, for every gas now, we can calculate the value of lambda. Also, we understand from this that lambda increases with decrease in pressure. So, as the pressure gets reduced, the value of lambda increases. That means, the distance between two collisions or the path starts increasing between the two collisions, which is understandable because as the pressure gets reduced down, the number of particles will get reduced. So, the number of collisions also will get reduced and molecule to molecule collision will take more path to be achieved by one molecule. So, as the pressure gets reduced, the value of lambda increases. It also increases with increase in temperature that can be understood from this because temperature happens to be in the numerator. The value of mean free path plays an important role in deciding the flow regimes in vacuum. So, this lambda is a very important characteristic or very important parameter which decides what is this different flow regimes in vacuum. Similar to the fact that we have got different flow regimes in continuum region, we have got different flow regimes in vacuum also. So, let us see what is this flow regime. Consider a closed system as shown in the figure and there are different molecules. Let us say at high pressure that means in compared to atmospheric pressures, we have got different molecules cramped together in a given space or given volume. But as you go down lowering the pressure, the number of molecules will get reduced and you may land up in a situation like this, where the number of molecules are reduced as the pressure is reduced and the residual molecules are now pulled apart. That means, the distance between the two molecules will start increasing and therefore, we say that here the molecules will have collisions at will. I mean, the time they move, the, the time that start having movement, they will have a collision over here, while here it is a probabilistic model. The depending on what direction the molecules move, it will have a collision and therefore, we say here the length between the two collision or the lambda value, the mean free path in this case will be more as compared to what it is over here and that is obvious from here. As a result, mean free path of residual molecules becomes larger than the dimension of the system. So, sometimes this mean free path will become more than the dimension of the, if it travels over here, it will possibly never collide with any other molecule. In that case, the mean free path may be more than the diameter, which is the characteristic dimensions of this particular uh, enclosure and the mean free path may be more than this or it will be comparable to that. In such system, molecules collide only when only with the walls of the container and they will never collide with the molecules themselves. So, molecule to molecule collision will be rare as the pressure goes down as, or as we go down to lower pressures. Such a flow of fluid is called free molecular flow. So, now we are talking about having a free molecular zone over here and this is where vacuum would come into picture basically because normally we will deal with such flows in vacuum. If lambda is much smaller than the characteristic length, 
such flows are called continuum flow. If lambda is very, very small, that means the length between the collisions or the time between the collisions is very, very small or as soon as the molecule starts moving, it collides with other molecules. So, in this case, lambda is going to be very small and this will not normally happen in continuum flow, which is what normally we will deal above atmospheric pressures. In fluid mechanics, Reynolds number is used to categorize the pipe flow regime as shown in the figure. So, we got a normally we deal with Reynolds number in continuum flow and we know that the Reynolds number is between 0 to 2300, 2300 what we call the flow is laminar while if the Reynolds number is between 2300 and 4000, we say that the flow is transition flow while above 4000, we say the flow is turbulent flow and this is very much known to all of you. In these flows, molecules collide with each other as well as with physical boundaries if any. That means, the molecules are in constant collision conditions, they are constantly colliding with each other and they also may collide with the walls or the physical boundaries of this pipe. Now, such thing may not exist at low pressures. All right. So, in this case, pressures are in the range of atmospheric values. While if we go to the vacuum now, we have got a different flow regime now and we do not have Reynolds number over in vacuum now. What we have now here is called Nudson number, normally written as N k n is used to categorize the flow regimes in vacuum. So, here we always deal with a different number and not Reynolds number and the moment we specify Nudson number, we know that we are talking about flow regimes in vacuum now. And what is this Nudson number now? This concept is analogous to Reynolds number in fluid mechanics and the Nudson number n k n is given as n k n is equal to lambda by d, where lambda is mean free path and d is the characteristic diameter or dimension. So, if you know that as we have lower and lower pressure, the value of lambda will go on increasing. That means, the Nudson number will go on increasing as we have got better and better and better vacuum. And according to the value of this Nudson number now, we will have different flow regimes in vacuum. So, I will have different Nudson number now. So, based on the Nudson number n k n, the above figure characterizes the flow regimes in vacuum. So, when I say my Nudson number is less than 0 0.01, I will say I am in continuum region that lambda is much smaller than d in this case. But as lambda starts increasing, Nudson number starts increasing. So, if I am between 0 0.01 to 0 0.3, I have something called as mixed flow over here. So, my lambda is now increasing because the pressure is decreasing and if my Nudson number is between 0 0.01 to 0 0.3, I will have something called as mixed flow and if my Nudson number is more than 0 0.3, that means, lambda is 0 0.3 times dimension of the characteristic dimension, I am in something called as free molecular region. So, my molecules are in a free molecular flow region here. They are in the mixed flow regime. In this case, when the lambda, when the Nudson number is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.3 and if the Nudson number is less than 0 0.01, I am actually calling, I am still in continuum region. Here, the lambda value is going to be very, very small as compared to the dimensions or the characteristic dimension of the container. Summarizingly, we, we will say that we have got a continuum flow for Nudson number less than 0 0.01, mixed flow between Nudson number having between 0 0.01 and 0 0.3 and free molecular flow for Nudson number greater than 0.3. The lambda value will go on increasing, Nudson number will go on increasing and I will reach to a free molecular regime when the Nudson number is more than 0.3. So, let us call now because as we go on lowering the pressures, we normally would call the pressures by different unit in this case. So, let us understand what are normal units of pressure and then we will define how do we refer to different vacuum levels. So, in SI unit, pressure is measured in Pascal or Newton per meter square. Very often, bar is also used for pressure measurement. You know this. For example, the standard atmospheric pressure can be expressed as 1.013 into 10 to the power 5 Pascal, 1.013 into 10 to the power 5 Newton per meter square. This is what normally we would use in SI or in thermodynamics also we got a 1 bar or we got a 760 millimeter of mercury column at standard sea level. This is what our standard uh, units of pressure, this is what we use normally in thermodynamics and heat transfer and fluid mechanics and thing like that. Now, in vacuum, normally unit of pressure is TOR, T O double R TOR or sometimes also millibar. This unit is named after Evangelista Torricelli, 
you must have heard about Torricelli, an Italian physicist in the year 1644. So, to honor this scientist Torricelli, we have got a unit of pressure specifically used in vacuum. The vacuum therefore, will be called as so many tors or sometimes in millibar also and this unit is named after the scientist Torricelli in the year 1644. So, one tor, what is this one tor? One tor is defined as 1 millimeter of mercury column at standard sea level. So, imagine that 760 millimeter of mercury column makes 1 atmosphere, 1 bar while 1 millimeter makes 1 tor here or we can say 1 by 760 bar is nothing but 1 tor or 1 by 760 atmosphere is nothing but equal to 1 tor. So, naturally the pressures in this range are much below atmosphere, much below 1 bar. Therefore, 1 tor is equal to 133.28 Pascal or 1 Pascal is nothing but 1 Newton per meter square. So, 133.28 Newton per meter square. So, there is a conversion table for your reference which is going over here. So, we can have different units, we can have vacuum could be presented sometime in Pascal, bar, atmosphere or tor. Normally, it will be referred in tor and here we got different conversions from Pascal to atmosphere, Pascal to tor. So, I can say that 1 Pascal is equal to 10 to the power minus 5 bar, 1 Pascal is equal to 7.5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 tor. Similarly, 1 bar is equal to 10 to the power of 5 Pascals, 1 bar is equal to 750.06 tor or 1 tor which is what we vacuum is referred to as is equal to 133.3 Pascal or 1.31 into 10 to the power minus 3 atmosphere. So, one can understand from this, if I were to convert different units of vacuum or pressures into other units, this is a kind of a conversion table for your usage. Similarly, we know that 1 milli is nothing but 10 to the power minus 3 and 1 kilo is 10 to the power 3. So, sometimes kilo Pascal could be written over here. So, I can say 1.33 kilo Pascal is equal to 1 tor also. All right, because sometimes you can understand like this also. Now, there are different degrees of vacuum depending on the levels of different pressures. So, as I mentioned earlier, pressures are lower than atmospheric pressure in vacuum spaces and depending on how low they are, depending on their values, we got something called as degrees of vacuum. So, depending upon the pressure in the system, the degree of the vacuum is categorized. The table on the next slide correlates the pressure and the degree of vacuum. So, normally we call I should have low vacuum, I should have very low vacuum, I should have ultra low vacuums and things like that. They are all classified based on what is the level of pressure over there and therefore, let us have a look at this degree of vacuum. So, degree of vacuum normally called as rough vacuum. In most of the industrial applications, we got rough vacuum wherein the pressure is between 760 tor which is nothing but one atmosphere approximately and 25 tor. So, when your pressure is between 25 tor and 760 tor, we have got rough vacuum or in kPa, we got a 3 kPa and 103 kPa. So, if my pressure is between 103 kPa and 3 kPa, we got a rough vacuum. Then we got a medium vacuum between 25 tor to 0 0.001 tor, 10 to the power minus 3 tor or also given in Pascals over here. Then we got a high vacuum. So, we got a rough vacuum, medium vacuum, high vacuum. The high vacuum is between 10 to the power minus 3 to 10 to the power minus 6 tor. So, again you can understand that I am come down to 10 to the power minus 6 tor which is between high vacuum when the pressure is between minus 3 and minus 6 tor. Sometimes it is referred as when one would not say 10 to the power minus 3 to 10 to the power minus 6, one can always say that vacuum is of the order of minus 3 to minus 6 or it is between minus 3 and minus 6. Normally, it is understood that this is 10 to the power minus 3 and 10 to the power minus 6. These are different levels of vacuum. And then we got a very high vacuum between minus 6 to minus 9 levels, all right. When we got a pressure of the order of 10 to the power minus 8, minus 9, we say we are in very high vacuum region. And then we got an ultra high vacuum which is used for very special purposes and this is now less than pressure less than 10 to the power minus 9 tor. So, you can understand normally most of our operation happens between medium vacuum to high vacuum in this region, at least in cryogenics. unless very high levels of vacuum are expected, then you know very special applications would expect ultra high vacuum uh, to be there. In that case, what kind of material do you use? What processes do you use? All these aspects become very important because you need a very high level of vacuum in this case and therefore, kind of processes you use here are very, very important. So, slide number 16 correction. 
So, we can say that from the here 1 tor is equal to 0 0.133 kilo Pascal. So, we have understood what are various degrees of vacuum now and therefore, now we will go to little practical applications or how to get good vacuum, but before that we will have to understand the flow rates, the pressure drop because if I want to vacuum particular space, I will connect that space to a vacuum pump and I will connect that space to vacuum pump through a tube or a pipe. And to begin with now, we will have a pressure drop across this pipe and therefore, we will have molecular flow region. We will be now talking about not a continuum region, but maybe we will be talking about molecular flow regimes and therefore, we will have to understand what is the pressure drop that happens, what are the mass flow rate that happens when we are talking about molecular flow and therefore, let us understand the pressure drop or the mass flow relationships as we go down from continuum flow to mixed flow and mixed flow to molecular flow region and this is very important to understand to calculate the mass flow rate and the pressure drop delta p across a tube of let us say length l and therefore, let us understand what is this pressure drop and mass flow rate relationships for continuum region, mixed flow region and molecular flow region. So, we know that in a pipe if the fluid is traveling across the pipe of constant cross section area as shown in the figure will have pressure drop across this region from 1 to 2 will have a pressure drop with passage of time. For simplicity, let the flow region be continuum, let us assume it is continuum region now. As the fluid flows from point 1 to point 2, there is the pressure drop due to viscosity and therefore, what will have pressure at this point 2 will be less than pressure at this point 1. So, P 2 is going to be less than P 1 because of the friction because of the surface conditions, because of the viscosity of the fluid. The difference between the inlet and exit pressures which is P 1 minus P 2 is what we call as pressure drop. Let this be, this be denoted as delta P and therefore, we can say delta P is equal to P 1 minus P 2 and this is a very standard fluid mechanics practice to calculate delta P across the region when the flow rate is around let us say m dot or whatever it is. So, pressure drop for a laminar continuum flow and when I say laminar flow, we are talking about Reynolds number less than around 2300, less than 2300 and this is a very standard equation delta P is equal to 128 mu L m dot upon pi into d to the power 4 into rho and this is called as Poiseuille's equation in fluid mechanics which correlates pressure drop delta P to mass flow rate m dot. So, if the length is L and the mass flow rate is m dot and the diameter is d, then during this travel I will have delta p amounting to this and one can see from here that delta p is directly proportional to the length it travels. Delta p is directly proportional to the m dot mass flow rate. If the mass flow rate is high, delta p is going to be high. If the length is high, delta p is going to be high while if the d is small, delta p is going to be very, very large. Delta p is dependent on d to the power 4 which is a very important parameter. So, in continuum flow we can see that delta p is inversely proportional to the fourth power of d all right. This is a very important parameter please note that. So, here mu and rho are viscosity and density here you can say mu and rho are viscosity and density of the fluid while L and d are the length and the diameter of the tube and the delta p is directly proportional to the length and delta p is inversely proportional to the fourth power of d as far as we are talking about laminar continuum flow. For rough vacuum now, when the Nernst number is less than 0.1 as mentioned earlier, the operating parameter pressure is now between 25 to 760 torr which we know now. I am talking about Nernst number less than 0 0.01. An ideal gas behavior is assumed here and hence the correlation between the average pressure and density is rho is equal to P m by R t. So, you got an ideal gas law here, all right. So, here rho and t are density and temperature of gas and we are talking about now rough vacuum, Nernst number less than 0 0.01 or operating pressure between 25 to 760 torr, we are having that ideal gas relationship is valid. m is the molecular weight of the gas, r is the universal gas constant while p is the average pressure. So, we have found that for this continuum region, Nernst number less than 0 0.01, we got a delta p is 128 mu L m dot upon pi into d to the power 4 into rho 
we know also rho is equal to pm by rt and if i put the value of rho over here combining the above two equations the pressure drop delta p for a continuum laminar flow is this and from here i get relationship it for m dot having m dot over here i'll get m dot and delta p related so m dot is equal to pi into d to the power 4 p m into delta p divided by 128 mu l rt so basically delta p and m dot are directly proportional and you got a relationship between delta p and l and d therefore you got a relationship between m dot and d and p d and delta p from the above equation it is clear that the mass flow rate m is directly proportional to the pressure drop so if the pressure drop is higher mass flow rate is going to be higher and it's directly proportional to the fourth power of diameter here delta p we are talking about when delta p had inverse relation with the fourth power of d while mass flow rate has now direct re relationship between the to the fourth power of diameter now that was with the continuum flow and let us talk about now mixed flow or with the lowering of pressure in the tube when the Nudson number is between 0 0.01 and 0.3. An intermediate flow regime between the continuum and the free molecular flow exists now as we have seen different flow regimes in vacuum now. This regime is called as mixed flow or slip flow. So, what is happening now? We are somewhere in between molecular flow region and continuum region. And that is why it is called as mixed flow region and in such condition the gas molecules close to the wall appear to slip past the wall with a finite velocity parallel to the axis of the tube and hence it is called as slip flow. In the earlier case in the continuum region we know that the velocity of the particles at the wall is equal to 0. We know that the pressure is the flow rate is maximum in the center and is 0 at the walls of this pipe. But as the number of molecules go on lessening, as the Nudson number is getting, getting increased or as the lambda starts getting increased, this molecule at the wall will also have some finite velocity and therefore, it will not be velocity equal to 0 over in this case. It will have some finite velocity and therefore, we say that the molecules appear to slip past the wall. It is going, it is not stopping over there. It is going it is slipping past the wall with a finite velocity and therefore, this velocity will also be showing up in the calculation of delta p or mass flow rate. And therefore, in slip flow, we will have something what was happening in continuum flow plus because of the change in velocity or because of the velocity existing at the finite velocity at the walls of this pipe, we will have one more parameter appearing in the pressure or in the mass flow rate calculations. So, from the kinetic theory of gases, mass flow rate and pressure drop for slip flow in a circular tube is given by this formula. So, you can see now m dot is equal to something into 1 plus something. So, this is the same as what it was in a continuum flow and this is what we had in a continuum flow. This is the expression for m dot in continuum flow and this is nothing but same. On comparison of above equation with mass flow rate for continuum laminar flow, we know that the first term accounts for the internal laminar flow away from the walls. That means, at the center near the center of the tube this will account for that, but the second term is now accounting for the slip or the finite velocity of the gas molecules will have near the walls. The second term accounts for the finite velocity correction near the tube walls. This will make the matter little complicated because in earlier case mass flow rate was directly proportional to d to the power 4. In this case however, we got a d to the power 4 here and we got a d in the denominator over here and therefore, the relationship between the mass flow rate and the diameter is not so much clear. All right? So, we can understand however, m dot is directly pro proportional to still delta p. So, from the above equation, the mass flow rate m dot is directly proportional to the pressure drop which is delta p. However, the dependence of diameter d of the tube is more complex as compared to the fourth power relationship in laminar continuum flow. So, earlier we had m directly proportional to d to the power 4, well in this case we got a m which is a complex relationship with diameter because diameter appears in the finite velocity here in the denominator, while in the continuum region it was appearing in the numerator only. So, you can see the change that has occurred because we shifted from a continuum region to a mixed flow region now or the Nudson number between 0 0.01 and 0 0.3. Let us, if we go down the pressure earlier, Nudson number will be more than 0 0.3. With further lowering of pressure, when Nudson number is more than 0 0.3, 
the number of molecules are reduced as well as the residual gas molecules are pulled apart. So, we have seen earlier the lambda value has increased now and therefore, the collision path the, the path between having two collision has become comparable with the characteristic dimension. The nuts are now is more than 0.3, the pressures are less, the distance between the molecules will increase. This flow regime is called as free molecular flow. In such conditions, mean free path lambda of the molecules is larger or comparable with the diameter of the tube, the flow is limited due to collisions of molecules with the walls. This is what we had talked about earlier. In this case now, the mass flow rate m and the pressure drop in a free molecular flow are related by this formula. So, we got a m dot now directly proportional to d cube over here, while m dot is still directly proportional to delta p. However, its dependence on diameter has changed. So, if you recollect in the continuum region, it was dependent directly on d to the power 4. In the slip flow, it was a complex relationship, while here in the molecular region m dot is now directly dependent on power 3 of the diameter d cube basically. So, things are changing as we shift from continuum region to free molecular region and this is very important because we will have to calculate or we will have to understand what is the diameter should I use, what is the length should I use if I were to connect my vacuum pump with the space to be vacuum all right? or if I know that region to be vacuum has so much diameter and length. I will have to understand the dynamics of molecular flow in that particular space. From the above equation, it is clear that the mass flow rate m is directly proportional to the pressure drop delta p and directly proportional to the third power of diameter. This is what we have understood. Now, let us come to the next nomenclature which is prevalently used in vacuum technology which is nothing but throughput and normally designated as q. So, apart from mass flow rate m, the rate of fluid flow is often measured by a quantity called as throughput q. So, we, we can call something as mass flow rate which is kg per second or something like that, but then we have got one more parameter called q and it is very important because it talks about both pressure and volume flow rates also. So, what is this q? The throughput is defined as a product of volumetric flow rate v and pressure measured at the point where V is measure. Wherever we are measuring mass flow rate or volumetric flow rates, at the same place we will measure pressure also and pressure into mul multiplied by that volumetric flow rate will give me what is called as throughput and therefore, it will have units of pressure as well as volumetric flow rates. So, mathematically we have Q is equal to P into V dot. So, volumetric flow rates, let us say in liter per second, liter per minute, liter per hour or any other dimensions we can have and pressures, we can have pressure diameters as tor or bar or millibar, kilo pascals or whatever. So, the, the SI units of throughput therefore, are pascal meter cube per second, pascal for pressure, meter cube per second for volumetric flow rate. Very often at low pressure, it is also expressed in tor liter per second. Mostly I have seen that various places we got a tor liter per second or millibar liter per second. So, tor liter per second, tor is for pressure liter per second or uh, meter cube per second will be for the volumetric flow rate and this is the way normally the throughput is mentioned. Assuming an ideal gas behavior, the volumetric flow rate V is expressed using ideal gas law which is nothing but V dot is equal to m dot R t divided by p and R by m is nothing but specific gas constant. So, therefore, we have got this m as molecular weight of the respective gases. From the above definition and this has come from basically P v is equal to m R t. From the definition of throughput now, can we put the value of v dot in that equation and therefore, what we have is q is equal to p v dot and if you put the value of v dot in this equation, this pressure and this pressure will get cancelled out and therefore, I will get q is equal to m dot r t upon capital M. So, I have got a relationship between now mass flow rate and specific gas constant and temperature to value of q and here m is a mass flow rate, m capital M is molecular weight of the gas, T is a temperature, R is a universal gas constant. Now, it is important now to note that vacuum system involves complex piping arrangements. If I want to vacuum a particular space, I will connect that space by different by having different piping arrangement and these pipes could be in parallel to each other, these pipes could be in series with each other and to analyze if I connect pipe 
of a particular dimensions d and l to another pipe of d and l, it will give me different throughputs. It will give me different something called as resistance to the flow or delta p and therefore, it is very important to understand what happens if I connect these pipes of a given dimension in series or in parallel and therefore, this series connection and parallel connection could be understood, could be well understood by having electrical analogy. We know Ohm's law basically, we know the resistances in series, resistances in parallel and therefore, understanding this piping in connection in series and parallel based on the electrical analogy is always very simple. So, let us try to understand that parameter. So, in order to analyze these systems, a mathematical theory is developed based on an analogy between electrical circuits and piping systems. Linear transport laws like Ohm's law and Fourier laws are used in formulating the problem. So, let us understand electrical analogy. We know that when a small current of I is passed through a resistance, which has got a potential difference of delta V, we got a certain resistance, which is automatically get connected by Ohm's, Ohm's law. So, consider a small electrical conductor as shown. When a current I flows across this conductor, there is a voltage drop delta V due to the resistance R offered by the conductor and this is very simple and they are related to each other by Ohm's law. These quantities are mathematically related by Ohm's law as given below. So, Ohm's law says delta V is equal to I into R. Now, can we compare these electrical circuits of having voltage difference across a given resistance of length L through which a current I flows. So, now let me compare this with a pipe and this I say that a pipe flow occurs Q which is comparable with I and this Q occurs only when the delta P occurs across the length of the pipe and the length of the pipe is L and delta P is the pressure drop across the length of the pipe. So, similarly, consider a fluid flowing across a small pipe as shown above. So, I can now compare electrical circuit with a pipe. So, I can see that I gets compared with Q and delta V can get compared with delta P, while the resistance is nothing but maybe some kind of conductance. I can get you know have a different parameters which will be analogous to which will be related to the resistance in the electrical circuit. So, for a throughput Q, there is the pressure drop delta P due to conductancy offered by this pipe. So, in pipe normally we do not call resistance, but we refer to this as conductance and therefore, what is conductance area? Reciprocal of R is nothing but conductance. So, if I got a parameter R in electrical analogy, I will say 1 by R is nothing but conductance. So, from electrical circuit I can compare this with the conductance of the pipe and conduction of the pipe, pipe C is related to 1 by R of electrical circuit. All right. So, I got three different comparisons I with Q, delta V with delta P and C in conductance of pipe to the 1 by R value in the electrical circuits. So, comparing the above figures, we have delta V analogous to delta P, I analogous to Q and R is analogous to 1 by C. Now, therefore, we can write delta V is equal to I into R and therefore, I can write delta P is equal to Q into 1 by C. Q is nothing but similar to R I and 1 by C is nothing but similar to R and therefore, I will get delta P is equal to Q by C in our equation for fluid flow in a small pipe and this is what basically a comparison of fluid mechanics or the flow regimes in vacuum will be with the electrical energy when the, when the current flows through a conductor. So, let us we have just floated a term called C, but we are not yet defined and therefore, we will try to understand what this conductance in a vacuum defined as. So, the conductance is related to delta P by this equation delta P is equal to Q by C and therefore, I can say Q is equal to C into delta P. It is clear that for a given pressure drop delta P across a pipe throughput Q is directly proportional to conductance C. All right. So, for if I got a some value of Q given over here, then I will have throughput Q directly connected or directly related to delta P or direct, directly connected to conductance C. So, if C increases, Q increases. 
if my delta p is given to me, so q will vary in accordance to the variation in c directly, they are directly related to each other. So, if I want to have more and more q, I should increase the conductance of that particular pipe. So, increase the c, increase the value of q and this will be good for creating vacuum in a particular space. For an ideal gas, following equation is holding true, q is equal to m dot rt upon m. This is what we have talked about earlier and we know from here delta p is equal to delta rho into rt by m. This is true with the gas which follows p v is equal to m rt and from where we could conclude that q is equal to m dot rt upon m dot and delta p is equal to q upon c or delta p is directly getting related to the gas law by this equation delta rho rt by m. Now, substituting these values over in this equation q and this q, we can put this q is equal to this q and we can have delta p as this over here putting these values, we will get now m dot rt upon m is equal to c into delta rho rt upon m, delta rho is nothing but density difference. So, now from here we can cancel out rt and rt, we can cancel out m and m and we get therefore relationship between m dot and conductance and delta rho. From here we can see that therefore, this will get cancelled and I get c is equal to m dot upon delta rho. So, now my conductance is nothing but mass flow rate divided by the delta rho, the density difference which is occurring because of the pressure difference p 1 and p 2 or the pressure drop occurring across the length L. So, conductance for a pipe for different flow regimes can be now derived by this formula can be derived by rearranging the pressure drop mass flow rate equations derived earlier. So, let us see all the derivations earlier. For continuum flow now, we will get conductance c is equal to pi into d to the power of 4 p because now we know that from the earlier calculations we know that c is equal to m dot upon delta rho. I will put this into all other equations which, are, which we have calculated for m dot for various regimes just divided by delta rho. It will cancel out delta rho in that particular equation and therefore, what we will get is for continuum flow, we will get c is equal to this conductance is directly proportional to the d to the power 4. For a mixed flow, for the Nutzen number between 0 0.01 and 0 0.3, we will get c is equal to this formula similar to what we had done earlier. And similarly, for free molecular region now, we will get conductance is equal to this. What does it mean? It means that if I know the length of a pipe, if I know the diameter of the pipe, if I know the average pressure in the system, if I know the temperature, if I know the gas to be vacuum, I can calculate conductance for that pipe, for that gas, for a given delta p, for a given pressure, for a given length and given diameter of the pipe, I can calculate conductance of different pipes. Many times now we can have standard equations to calculate conductance for a bend, for a conductance for a straight length, conductance for diametral changes in the pipe lengths and these are the formulae which will help us to calculate conductance for different pipes of different length and diameters for different gases. And therefore, it is very important to know such relationships which are normally standardized to understand what happens to the conductance when there is a bend in a pipe, when the pipe is straight, when the pipe has got some you know curvature for example. All these equations help us to calculate conductance of pipe which ultimately would help us to calculate the what will the pressure drop that will happen if I have this vacuum pump over there or how much time it will take for me to reach down to the lower and lower vacuum levels for a given pump of the, when I connect the vacuum pump to a given space through such pipes. All right, So, very important to understand what is this conductance and how it is related to the operating parameters and the dimensions of the pipe. So, conductance is vacuum. Now, we can have conductance when the two pipes are connected in series and the pipes could be connected in parallel the way we have in resistances connected in series and parallel. So, consider a series combination of two pipes with C1 and C2 as individual conductances respectively with delta P1 and delta P2 as the pressure drop happening. Let Q be the throughput for this pipe. It is clear that a series combination of Q is the same for each pipe. Q is going to be the same because whatever Q happens through this pipe, the same Q is going through this pipe. It is similar to I. I is the same 
when it is entering at this point and it is going through this particular resistance. The pressure drop in each pipe are going to be delta P1 and delta P2 respectively and therefore, we can say delta P1 is equal to Q by C1. C1 and C2 are conductances of this pipe of different dimensions and length. Accordingly, we will have delta P1 is equal to Q by C1, delta P2 is equal to Q by C2. And what we know? Let us have a overall conductances, conductance as C0 and let us try to relate that to this. And we also know that the overall pressure drop delta P is equal to delta P1 plus delta P2. So, let the overall conductance and the total pressure drop in the system be C0 and delta P respectively. And what we know therefore, is total for the equation for this is delta P is equal to Q upon C0. All right. And we know also delta P1 is equal to Q by C1, delta P2 is equal to Q by C2. Now, I know delta P is equal to delta P1 plus delta P2 and therefore, I will get an equation as 1 by C0 is equal to 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2, where Q and Q will get cancelled if they are put in this particular equation. What does it mean? It means that when the two pipes are connected in series, the effective or overall conductance of these pipes when they got a C1 and C2 of respective conductances will get 1 by C0 is equal to 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2. And this is what happens in the resistance in series 1 by C2 nothing but overall resistance R0 is equal to R1 plus R2. Same, same thing happen over here when the conductances are getting connected to each other in series. So, if I got this we did only for two pipes, I can have now n number of pipes. So, extending to n pipes in series, I will get 1 upon C0 is equal to sigma 1 by C i, i ranging from 1 to n in that case. So, if I know different pipes connected in series, what will I do? I will cal calculate their respective conductances and get overall conductance calculated by this formula. So, 1 upon C0 is equal to 1 upon C1 plus 1 upon C2 plus 1 upon C3 etcetera would give me the overall conductance of a given series pipe connection. Now, let us see what happens if the pipes are connected in parallel. So, similarly, consider a parallel combination of two pipes. Let us say C1 and C2 are the conductances of these two pipes. While as you can say that some Q1 will go through this pipe, some Q2 will go through this pipe depending on the diameters of this pipe. Let us see that they are having same length and therefore, we will have the delta P happening across them is going to be the same because the same gas will get split up or the flow will get split up here and the flow will come back here. As a result of which the pressure at the entrance and the pressure at the exit will be same and therefore, both in both these pipes which are connected in parallel, the pressure drop is going to be the same. This was not the case when they are connected in series. So, let C0 and Q be connect be given and then we have delta P be the same. We know that Q is equal to C0 delta P which is overall Q and we know that Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2 also because Q is coming from here, Q is coming out from here. When they are traveling in this parallel pipes, they are getting split up into Q1 and Q2 and Q1 is nothing but C1 into delta P, delta P is same all over. Q2 is equal to C2 into delta P and therefore, what we know is Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2 and if I write them together delta P delta P will get this is common basically and therefore, I will get C0 is equal to C1 plus C2. So, when the pipes of C1 and C2 conductances are connected in parallel to each other, the overall conductance will get added as C1 plus C2 directly and therefore, this is the overall conductance for pipes which are connected in parallel with each other. So, extending this to n pipes, we will have 1 C0 is equal to sigma C i when i is extending from 1 to n pipes. So, we saw what is conductance when they are connected in series, what is overall conductance when they are connected in parallel to each other. Summarizing this lecture, Heat in leak is minimized by having vacuum between two surfaces of different temperatures. Lambda which is nothing but mean free path is defined as the average distance traveled by the molecules between the subsequent collisions. Based on Knudsen number which is lambda by d, we have continuum flow when Knudsen number is less than 0 0.01, we have got a mixed flow when Knudsen number is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.3 and we have got a free molecular flow when the Knudsen number is more than 0 0.3 when the lambda is increasing from continuum flow to free molecular flow.
and we know that conductances of pipe which are connected in a series is 1 by C 0 is equal to sigma 1 by C i and when they are connected in parallel we know that C 0 is equal to sigma C i they will just get added C 1 plus C 2 plus C 3 etcetera. Thank you very much.